uh, we're going to do the panel session today, and and I'd like to welcome uh, Karina Butterworth uh, to the panel as well. Uh, so nice to see you, Kar Karina. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, great initiative you've got going there with Alex, and uh, uh, you know, Sate is really a, a significant player in this field, and uh, and doing some great things. Uh, well, I, I consider it Alex's baby for the most part. <laughs> It's his brains. I'm just executing it over here. <laughs> well, very good, very good. So I thought I could, uh, and of course, uh, you know, we're we're welcoming questions from uh, from the viewers and and so forth to put in the chat. But I don't see anything there yet. So maybe maybe I can kick this off with a little bit. Uh, it's come uh, been mentioned a few times in different presentations. You know the the. Well, I'm, I'm not sure this is the right word to use, but the hype around artificial intelligence. And uh, we see it now everywhere. Uh, it's quite ubiquitous. Uh, you know, even even commercial products are talking about, you know, how AI helps the, the picture on your TV and, and things like that. So let's bring that down to... Uh, uh, to LIDAR, and, and I, I would expect uh, the main thing here would probably be, you know, potential improvements to LIDAR processing and classification, uh, perhaps in the SLAM world with positioning and so forth, but uh, what, are, what are people's comments related to uh, AI um, in the LIDAR field? And I'll, um, maybe, maybe uh, just based on my screen, while we have Katrina uh, right here in front of me now, maybe we'll go Katrina, then Alex, then Kenneth, then Susan, and I, I can give my little two cents worth at the end. So, uh, Katrina, please. Karina, with no team. Karina, Katrina. <laughs> Three so strikes. To, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Did um, so just to repeat the question, just like the what the future of AI is going to be having. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I come in with a very um, major education background, so I see I see AI in terms of education and teaching the stu the, the students and teaching ed the industry and trying to get that out there. Um, and I, I mean, AI is definitely going to play a part for sure. It's going to improve workflows. It's going to make things faster. But right now, the limit of AI is that it doesn't do infinite applications. Um, so with it, we're, we still need people to understand what that result is giving. We still need people to understand, you know, is it, is it correct what it's giving? Um, and then interpret the results of it. So there, there's still limitations with AI that we need to consider um, as much as we would love to be able to say, yeah, push a button and off you go. We, that understanding of it, and it's gonna give a wrong result. And if you don't understand what, it's, what that wrong result is giving, then you're gonna have a problem. So I see AI actually building the world of education on like, how do you actually interpret rather than how do you actually use it? So it's like, just push a button. Now, what is that actually giving you? ChatGPT is a really good example. Um, I've had students try giving me stuff that has come out of ChatGPT and it's so easy to identify it because it's general, it's mm. not specific. It, it's unable to do that. So the infinite number of applications, it's gonna be handy for a limited amount. And then we're gonna have to use humans to be able to understand that unlimited application side of it. No, good. Some good points. Alex, would you like to add to that? Yeah. Um, OK, so ultimately uh, going to looking at the finish line, I'm really excited for things like um, uh, artificial general intelligence, because that is supposed to be one of those things that unlocks exactly how do you look at it, how many different ways you can. But no, I agree with everything that Karina just said. Um, yeah. Uh, AI right now, um, you know, it's really good at helping us build reports and, and it's really good for drafting uh, documents and, you know, it, it's really good for identifying where things are. But like Karina said, you, you can't trust it as, you know, push a button, send, here you go, Mr. Cl Mr. and Mrs. Client. Um, it's, there's a lot of work that needs to go behind it. And even now, artificial intelligence, anything beyond the GPT, um, there really is a metric as to whether this is saving us time or making you know making making work mm -hmm. um sometimes it's only a half second difference between uh, the manual process and the automatic process but if you save half a second twenty six thousand times you just saved yourself quite a bit of time mm -hmm. um so it, yeah it, it, right now it is um it's incremental but it's changing in a really big way uh, i love engaging with some of these development companies because you get a real sense for how many of them are 
working with rudimentary and putting a human at the end of it, or the ones that are actually giving you an AI model that you need to then go in and, um, and look at the results of. Um, so it is, it, yeah, no, it's an exciting time. Uh, but yes, we're, we're still very much in the opening phases. Kenneth, how about yourself on this topic? Yeah, so I actually worked for an AI company or a company that was going to design, that was designing its own AI stuff before. And what we see through that was uh, we, when, you want, when it comes to classifying and detecting and using AI, there's a lot of deep learning involved there. So, and, and training processes can be very rigorous. So where I was going with that was we have to identify what training data sets are available, how good the quality of these, these data sets are, and also what are we trying to achieve with a... AI, is it an automated um, program that we're really after to, to classify and detect a specific thing, say, all right, we've got hundreds of kilometers of curve line. We just want that. Or we have 20,000 points of attachment on a wire. Do That's something we want. So very specific um, requirements on an automated process. That's where I see it. Um, so that really determines what kind of data set goes in and out. It's not at that point where we can you know, uh, throw, it, throw an entire LiDAR data set into a so-called AI and spit out everything that's classified. It's, it's a lot of decisions that need to go in there. And when we were talking about designing a... Um, a framework for this, so like the neural networks and decision making processes for uh, for an AI process. How many decisions and permutations and combinations that come out from that? That that all has to be de determined. So it's a very complex set of rules that we need to understand. So are we there yet? Probably not, but um, it's it's getting there. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Susan. Uh, could we have your perspective, please? Yes, uh, you know, one of the great things about being almost last is everything that you guys said, yes, I agree. <laughs> um, so on our side, you know, we look at AI applications with doing automated classification of our massive LiDAR data sets and also feature extraction from the LiDAR data sets. And, you know, like I said yesterday when we when we had our sort of pre pre-panel get together is that there's a wide range of you know, really bad AI out there. And we're, of course, approached all the time by um, companies that, you know, want us to use their services. And we always give out a, you know, pilot area to see what they can do. And it's really, it's been really difficult to find a service out there that, that does the classification and feature extraction better than we can do it. And, you know, the other side of the coin is, if you're going to use AI, you have to have confidence in the data that you get out of it. So the QC side is massive on our side. Once we receive this data set, we still have to manually go through it and see if it's meeting our needs. And so there's the cost balance isn't there yet. Um, we're getting there. And obviously things are moving incrementally in terms of technology, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, as my, my colleagues have said, or co-presenters have said. No, great, great point. And uh, I, I concur, you've all, uh, you know, touched on different aspects of things. Um, you know, it's really challenging to, to sort of keep up with it as well. I mean, every time you do a search of how many papers are out there, et cetera, it's just exploding. And, uh, you know, obviously in the, in the raster world with things like TensorFlow, you know, does a pretty good job of, you know, identifying people and cars and things like that, that I think is stemmed from the, uh, uh, the autonomous vehicle side of things, um, getting into the multispectral and, and imagery, uh, you know, perhaps a little easier. I, I still find it quite challenging to, to, to make use of that technology in the, in the point cloud environment. So uh, I, I certainly appreciate your comments on that one, Susan. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions. One sort of was there and then disappeared. So, uh, but I do remember it and I thought it was a pretty good question, which was, what are some of the dangers or, or concerns we might have around uh, AI and geomatics? So in other words, I and Susan, we'll start with you. 
Um, you know, I think you made a comment about, you know, there's a lot of bad, bad, not great working things out there and you still need to put eyes on it. So can you think about what, what perhaps we need to be cautious of or, or concerned about and potential danger of AI in the geomatics field? Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of my experience, um, it is that verification of the data. Um, you know, there is a danger in um, using data that's not been verified um, and then coming up with an end product that doesn't work for what the client needs or for what you might need if you're the, the end user. So I think um, that whole data verification and validation uh, part of AI is mm -hmm. is what is going to I think make this a longer process, a longer learning curve, um, because there are still you still find mistakes and stuff, even when it is um, so-called verified by by humans. No, maybe I can just jump in here as well. And most of these AI systems, they they come back and tell you how 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 good they think they've done. And exactly. uh, oftentimes, I find those statistics are a little bit biased or a little bit swayed. Um, so, you know, to have that human interaction to validate is uh, uh, an, still an incredibly important thing. Uh, let's go reverse order. So we've heard from Susan. Can we go? Let's go back to you, Ken, and then we'll do Alex and Karina. Kar Karina. Right. Yeah. So I'd just like to take it back to the, the inception of it or creation of an AI program or algorithm. The, the training is really important here. So you know, the, the pitfalls in that is how, what kind of data sets and what criteria do we put in to determine which data sets go into creating an AI, you know, the catch one all catch all phases, garbage in, garbage out kind of thing, right? So if from the, from the day one of creating the, these algorithms and your data sets are not good, then you're not gonna have a good product. So, what set of human eyes are on it? Um, where can you get your, where can you get good data sets? So like, for example, if we're trying to determine using LIDAR to determine curves and all this stuff, you don't want your curves to be noisy and and, and stuff like that. You don't want your points to be all, all scattered. How accurate is it? Is, it the, is the relative accuracy of the data set great? Is it like uh, the, the point cloud thickness one or two centimeters versus five? Because that can really, determine things. And if you put a 500-meter point cloud down a line into an AI that says it's one or two centimeters or expecting one or two centimeters, then that's not going to work at all, right? That kind of thing. So what, what is it expecting and what is it um, not expecting is a very big thing at this when I see what, at this point. So, yeah. Just, okay. just Alex, that. over... Oh, I'm sorry, Ken. Thank you. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm good. Uh, Alex, to you on this, please. Yeah, once again, uh, garbage in, garbage out. I think that's a pretty good phrase for everybody to remember. Um, and yeah, that is the difficulty with it, doing things like AI training. Uh, most companies that want to do it on their own through um, you know, some kind of uh, image segmentation software are finding that, yeah, they need to spend a really long time doing the clippings and they cannot be sloppy about it. They need to, they need to follow the edge of the thing they want um, in order to get an accurate representation. So uh, it, it, uh, and then you're right as well. So um, if some of the fastest ways of doing uh, some of the segmentation is doing the images first and then projecting those results onto your point cloud. Um, and like Ken has said, if the point cloud's no good, then you're gonna have a really hard time getting an interpretation on that. Um, so even just the AI, even if the AI works properly, are you pairing it with the right instrument to get the results that you need? And that's, um, uh, and, and even then, if you use that instrument, how is the AI going to react if it hasn't been trained on that particular unit? So, um, you know, everybody assumes that it's a picture. What's the difference? Um, it's an integrated picture. <laughs> it came from a lot of different systems, and they all need to be tied together. Um, so, yeah, uh, AI in general, um, it's, it's great. <laughs> Very challenging. <laughs> Okay, last word to you, Karina. Well, yes, to everything, every, what everyone's saying. So. <laughs> um, but I'm going to kind of go pull a little bit more on what Susan was saying earlier. And um, the, what I see is that the biggest danger is, is AI arrogance. And, and I, I mean, putting it kind of bluntly that way, but 
I, what I think is we're going to see people who think that they know what they do, they're doing because they're like, Hey, look, AI just did this all. And so I know everything. And we're already seeing a problem with that. When we have people going out they're they're buying these systems and, and units, and then they're going out and collecting data and not able to verify, not able to do any of that because they don't have the understanding of it. And then they're giving that as a, as a product to somebody and it becomes a real scar on geomatics because it's like, oh, we, um, our reputation goes down because these people, it's not regulated. It's not looked after like the engineering world, everything else um, in like mechanical engineering, it is all regulated, but geomatics is not. So we, it becomes a real scar on what we have. So we have a lot of people that don't have the training are becoming very data arrogant. And then we have um, the people who are really trying to do a good job, trying to make up for that everywhere, everywhere they go. So I see it as a, as a really big issue in that way. So. No, I think that's a really good point though. I mean, um, you, the people that are doing it now, they are the early adopters. And so if you, if you hurt your client now, you're not just denying yourself business later. You're shutting them off the whole industry, potentially crippling them down the road because their competitor is going to pick it up. Exactly. Yeah. No, uh -huh. those are some good points. Good points. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, this one's a little bit long, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best here. Should there be a specific LIDAR program at the college level in Canada? The follow-up, who is best placed to do this now, if so, uh, and following on, is there a sense of how many resources are going to be needed on the HR side over the next uh, year or two? So, I mean, I can comment generally here about, uh, for example, the COGS programs that we're, I'm quite familiar with. We don't have a specific LIDAR program, but rather a remote sensing program of which uh, there are two very strong hands-on LIDAR courses taught. And in our marine geomatics program, uh, the students are also exposed to a topobathymetric uh, LIDAR that, that my group used to be involved with and has now been passed over to the COGS faculty for training. But I do hear when I go to, say, GeoWeek and other uh, conventions like that that are very LIDAR specific, you know, there's a tremendous demand for l both LIDAR operators, LIDAR processors, uh, people who really understand LIDAR and, and, and so forth. So, um, uh, Karina, maybe we'll start with you being another educator. Um, you know, just your, your comment on that regarding a a dedicated program to LIDAR versus courses within a, a perhaps broader uh, program such as remote sensing or, or broad geomatics? Well, I can, yeah, that I to, to jump on that, I had like a thousand things go through my head. And of course, I'm like, well, of course, Sate's set up for that. No, <laughs> no competition there. No. Bias. But, um, <laughs> just a little. The, uh, but yeah, I definitely think that there should be. And but I, what I see it as is more of a micro credentialing thing. Um, I know that this is like the, the the buzzword right now, and I know Alberta's really like trying to get into that with the government here. But the idea of like, hey, I want to specialize in lidar is fantastic. After you have the foundation of geomatics first, then specialize. So that's where micro credentialing would be a fantastic option for that. Um, like I'd say, right now we have a drone lab that's specific to drones, and the guy who operates it is a geomatics professional, and he works with all different programs, doing all different kinds of things. We also have a, a lidar class that I teach, um, and laser scanning class, um, and we're but but the challenge with it is keeping up with the industry because it's so expensive trying to get access to this equipment you know try to get the newest and latest like you know you, when you have 32 students in a, in a class how do i get them all a handheld scanner and 32 units is a lot of money yeah. <laughs> so yeah. even with educational discounts um, so that's where, again, like a, a micro credential where we could like design something and it could be in it, like a national thing, but making sure that there's a hands-on component with it would be essential. And then anyone with a university degree that hasn't been able to specialize and do hands-on stuff, they could even come into it. Um, and I, I mean, I think that it would be amazing to collaborate across the country. So who is pl best placed? All colleges. Um, I think that if we all have our own type of uh, program and we, they can combine all of them into a micro-credential, that would be perfect. And then everybody can access it. Yeah. So 
resources though, to advance that third one, because I have it up on my screen. How many resources? I mean, you're going to need a lot of money. <laughs> so, and it won't be for coming from the governments, I guarantee that. So yeah, if there's a company out there that would want to sponsor something like that, that would be awesome. And then we could build that for, for the industry, definitely. No, thank you, uh, Susan. Maybe I'll maybe I'll come to you next because a uh, uh, a company such as yours, uh, you know, probably is is very well suited to ask to answer that question regarding about the HR issues and and the future and and even today what what you see are the challenges and so forth. So uh, could I hear from you, please? Yeah. So thank you. Our, I mean. Further to what Karina said, we actually are our main processing office is in Calgary and every year our um, our data processing manager goes down to say you folks have an open house every year and he goes down and collects resumes and and we kind of use SAIT sort of as our as our grocery store for for um, entry level folks. And, and we like the entry level, the folks that have just graduated because we can train them to do things exactly the way that we want them done. Um, but we also have folks that have masters and PhDs. Um, a lot of them are foreign trained because you can do um, PhDs and masters in a lot of other countries other than uh, Canada, unfortunately, in LIDAR and LIDAR research. Um, and so, so we pull in those. Um, you know, we're, we're a company that has a very stable employment force. So we don't have a lot of opportunities coming in because people come to us and they stay for a long period of time. Um, that being said, when there is a need, um, it can be difficult to find skilled skilled people, um, and so we use our we use our networks. You know, who do you know? Who did you go to school with that you might, um, you know, ask them to send their resume in? Um, not so much an HR department looking for a lidar person. It's a lot of, you know, who you know. And again, just you know, if there are any students um, in the audience, that's that hidden job market. Um, and you know, keeping in contact with folks, especially on LinkedIn after you've graduated, so that you are, you know, making those connections for future employment opportunities. Yeah, and I think we should probably tip our hat to Go Geomatics as well, because okay. uh, uh, you know they are by far probably one of the best forums for communication, talking about the different programs and education. Obviously, hosting events like this and so forth. So uh, I'm not just saying that, John, because I have three strikes on a as a panel host today, but uh, uh, I sincerely mean it. But uh, let's hear f next from Alex and then and then Ken, we'll get uh, the last word on this topic from you. Sure, I'll, I'll try to be really rapid. So I, I agree, um, you know, word of mouth and, and the colleges are a really good place to start um, when it comes to the networking. Yeah, uh, I have yet to not recommend anybody I was afraid is gonna take my job on me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, the, the colleges are a specialty place and the fact that you need to understand things like control uh, when you're dealing with, with LIDAR um, is, that's something that you might not necessarily get in, uh, in another program, um, especially how it applies to us and how it helps us. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, when it comes to the HR side, no, you're absolutely right. Um, Lots of resumes, but uh, you know, I am a C plus plus expert because I have my co-pilot and I have an AI engine inside of my my Visual Basics suite. Uh, you know, like so, yeah. You, resumes really aren't the be all end all because you can put your most you can really inflate yourself um, if you think hard enough. Um, and it is, yeah, we need the application. We need it now. Ken. Yeah, you know. From where I see things these days is um, we have a lot of, we cast, when, when we come to the hiring process in Terra, we cast our net really wide just because of where we are located on the island here. So any, anybody who comes from like a geography background, um, we, we hire right off the bat, you know, just because of the, of the we, we, we need people fast. And when the season hits, we need to have people out there running our sensors, that kind of thing. But what we find from that is we always have a few couple of months to, for them to these new grads or um, new hires who don't really have a geomatics background. We, we need a few months to actually sh have them shadow us in, in the field or processing or, or whatnot. Because what it really comes down to in the field, you know, it's just not a push of a button. You really need to like go out there and assess what's going on. 
what are, what is the weather doing? Can you fly your lidar in uh, in light rain? Can you fly your lidar in heavy rain? Can, is the smoke um what is it the uh, smoke density out there good enough mm. to fly in? And then when you when you're talking about um, setting ground control, Alex, you know, it's um where where you place your your survey stations? Where do you place your photo targets? Do you put it on the on a, on a hill or next to a slope? That's going to be really bad for lidar. Or do you put it uh, next to a chain link fence? Now you're talking multipath, <laughs> you know that that sort of deal, right? So there's a lot at play here you, uh, when you go to field. So having that base level of understanding, it will certainly help companies out there to transition a new employee straight into the field, so that that they are very knowledgeable and um not just knowledgeable. They are they're able to like hold their own in the field with, without you know having a whole back and forth process because that's what, what we have right now and when we hire a batch of new recruits for a sense we have to set up whatsapp chats we have set up lots of um not that that's bad it's just the the reality these days that we have to have a lot of uh, channels open so that that's a back and forth process so so certainly having a um credited program you know that's um that encompasses a good base level understanding of geomatics is great. And then when it comes to LIDAR, you know, we can, it's a very niche market, so we can train people, but having the base level of what's going on in the field is important already. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree 100% that, that that base core level of competency with, uh, you know, GIS, remote sensing, uh, LIDAR, surveying, geodesy, et cetera, so that uh, you know the student understands datums, projections, etc. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when you talk about having somebody in the field, uh, the word that comes to my mind always is adaptation. Because uh, normally in the field, you've got to adapt to something that's changed, whether that be the environment, the sensor, um, something. And and to have people be able to be quick on their feet. Uh, and adapt to those those changes and still be able to collect high quality data. Those people are gold. Um, okay, we have another. So thank you all for that for that contribution. Uh, we have another question here. Um, is LiDAR, BIM slash SLAM, digital twins all connected? Are we seeing a digital transformation in the AEC sector globally? And I, I yes. think... The general answer is yes, but Alex, uh, I I will pass this one to you for the for the first. Uh... Sure, yeah. So, the, well, the, the slam scan off. Um, one of the reasons we're doing that is because the fact that this is so prevalent and it's becoming a, a major topic of discussion. And so, yeah, we're we're trying to um, we're trying to have this program exactly to answer these particular questions. Um, digital twinning. Uh, the digital twin industry is supposed to increase by, um, I think it's from 17 billion to 250 billion dollars uh, it, it, within the decade. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we don't have enough drafters for that. And we don't have enough people to scan for that. And we don't have we, like, we there, they are all going to be very much interconnected because of the fact that SLAM is going to facilitate where, um, where typical LIDAR and remote sensing instruments can't go. Um, and it's going to do it really quickly, and it's not necessarily going to do it cheaply, but you know, it's going to still be cheaper than sending people all over the place. And then, of course, the moment your scanner gets destroyed instead of a person, um, yeah, that, that, it's going to be another huge win for the industry. Uh, but uh, but yeah, going back to the whole thing, um, digital twins, yeah, lidar, slam, bim, all all married, uh, except. You know, it's, it's not restricted to those particular fields, but um, Europe and Asia are going absolutely nuts right now. Um, it's great that reality capture started in the United States, then Europe took it, and then Asia set it on fire, and now it's coming back to Europe as to North America as this like novel thing. Like, oh, look what we found! And everybody else is like, <laughs> yeah, it goes for it. So, just a quick follow up on that before I, I pass it to the others. You know, um, the United States is always you know, seems to be the forefront in leading some of this. But uh, given your clientele is both New England and, and you said Ontario and, and, and Central Canada of, of, out west as well. But, you know, um, are you can you comment on the uptake of the Canadian um, perspective on, uh, you know, looking to do more BIM and uh, this type of digital twinning? Um, 
most companies that we interact with still want the 2D deliverable. Um, most people are still having a hard time bringing in the 3D uh, for one reason or another. I won't make any assumptions as to why there's lots of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so when it comes to the BIM side of things, uh, I think larger institutions are the ones that are going to start leading the way in the application. Energy industry being a really big one. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of energy producers that are digital twinning now, um, taking LIDAR and actually incorporating it into their corporate strategy um, because they pop the hood on it and they realize like, oh, dang, you know, some of our sites are being scanned up to four times before any work is even done. Um, mm. Might as well just centralize this and just have our own crew send it out in critical moments. Um, that way, you know, they're saving just that one act alone has just cut their costs for LIDAR scanning in by two third, uh, three quarters. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, just going back to, yeah, the, the, it'll be the larger companies, I think, that will be leading the, the, the charge on this because they have the capital um, and they stand to benefit the most, even from incremental change. If you could save, uh, if you can save a major brand store 1% in a year, that's going to might not be big to them, but that's big to you and me. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I think they they watch that line. Uh, Susan, maybe I'll go to you next. I mean, I, I I expect the bread and butter of your company is is the the external environment, but but I'd be interested in your perspective on that. Well, there's there's uh, two things. Um, I want to talk about uh, BIM and public safety, and then I want to talk about. Um, sort of the emerging trend of mergers and acquisitions to provide a full service data. So on the BIM side, um, definitely LIDAR data and public safety, you know, for a fire truck to know exactly where to go in a building um, based on, you know, having BIM information um, is, is critical. And that is a moving trend that we're seeing. Municipalities using LIDAR data with um, married with their imagery to create these models so that public safety, you know, can know exactly where to go to rescue or save someone. Um, that is something that's happening. Um, you know, of course, uh, on the on the um, mergers and acquisition side. So, you know, companies are now, um, you know, so a, a large acquisition company like ours could purchase a company that specializes in doing the the slam BIM or digital twinning or whatnot, so that we can then give our customers a one-stop shop. We can customize the acquisition of the data to your end, your actual complete end use. And you don't have to go and find all of these different companies to, mm. um, you know, to, to create the service that you need. Um, there's definitely, I think the trend is going there. Again, you're using massive data sets. Um, and so you're all also, you know, dealing with that, the data management side of things. Um, but that's kind of where I see the, the trend going, those two sort of different areas, different but the same. Yeah, no, that's a good point about the uh, the acquisitions and so forth. It seems, uh, uh, you know, companies that are large enough, um, when they see a hot trend or a, a company doing well, you know, the idea of, of acquiring that company and folding it into their broader uh, mm -hmm. uh, offerings um, seems to be a, a fairly common way that we've seen the industry go. Um, maybe we'll go Katrina and then give Ken the last word on this topic. Katrina, over to you. Karina. Karina. <laughs> no <Hi>. tea. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I'll just keep correcting you. <laughs> thank you. My apologies. It's all good. Um, well, to kind of answer all of it in, in one kind of go here, um, how I see it, yeah, first of all, everything is definitely connected. In uh, the, the going stat is usually that Canada is about five years behind the US and about 10 years behind Europe. So <laughs> we, we're, we're still kind of catching up when it comes to um, being in in the same like realm as what the other parts of the world are. But um, I think that what really helps is being able to get this to students and get it to other industries that are teaching as well. So here's a product that you can get when, once you are in industry. And then when they come out, they're gonna be bringing that knowledge forward to their uh, their companies. And then that company will be like, oh, well, do you know how to deal with that kind of data? And then those, those students would be like, yes, you know, we did it with whatever. 
And then it comes back to us where it's like, okay, we need this data because we have somebody who's trained to use it. So I think that as we see like the digital transformation, we're going to see our younger generation that's coming through schools now that are getting their hands on this stuff and uh, being able to see the products of what we can provide in geomatics. I think we're definitely going to see a major digital transformation with the, the next generation coming through schools. Mm. And, and I think the fact that, that now LiDAR is becoming a little more ubiquitous on iPads and the iPhone and, and people can scan a coffee cup and then, oh, there's my digital twin. Um, you know, I, I, I think people will be a little more in, informed about that kind of idea and technology maybe moving forward as well. And, and you know, oh, this can be used for more sophisticated things than, uh, than just scanning my coffee cup. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I feel like yeah. you pointed that. <laughs> I, I love scanning my coffee cup. I have a favorite <laughs> coffee cup in my library. <laughs> uh, Kenneth, last word on that topic to you, please. Yeah, I'd like to highlight a couple of things here when, when it goes into adopting the Joel Twins all this stuff. It's um, one is being able to make rapid decisions and how quickly are you able to do it to make decisions? Well, uh, how how quickly do you need their information at your fingertips? So that's one that's definitely driving it. Is it a uh, host web hosting, and how do you collect data that's able that you're able to share across multiple departments or companies, agencies? Is it secure? So from like a little bit of an airborne perspective here, you know, if we collect a, a bunch of data sets over a landslide or 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 highway, um, how are we hosting that? How are we sharing that data is it a single format is it you know two formats is it clean kosher you know is it annotated you know all that stuff and then on the other side here as Chris is kind of driving it is our labor shortage right like if we have um, a, a bridge or something and right now we five departments need to go work on it say um, the the bridge inspectors and then you've got the snooper truck guys and then you've got maybe the road safety guys and then you've got the engineer and you know whoever right um maybe all these five departments don't have someone they can send out at the same time because of com completely conflicting projects ongoing conflicting projects you know on a timeline basis so having your data in-house and having it layered having multiple layers of these data sets year over year collected at your fingertips that's driving the decision making processes there right so like you don't have to send someone out of the field coordinate um a field time of these five different departments to go do this thing you know the field and, and everyone can sit down in the office and log into do this to a digital twin and kind of see what's going on at, at their own time and leisure so yeah, yeah. that's what this those are the two things i see driving the the community yeah. adoption of these yeah, good points. Good points. Uh, we have we have another question here, and this one's a rather broad statement. Uh, is Canada lacking in the application of LIDAR? And Karina, since I've done such a lousy job with getting you mixed up with, can you tell I know a Katrina? Um, so Karina, uh, let's start with you on this one. Are we is Canada lagging behind in the application of LIDAR? Um. I, so again, I'm coming from an education background, so that's what I, I see. So we saw a need for this 10 years ago. So we implemented a LIDAR laser scanning course in our in our program um, to be able to make sure that we had some educated people going out there to use this stuff. And um, so, but again, like I think when it comes to the industry, I think that we've got the ability and we've got the, the like we are using it. But it sounds like, and I'm just going with like what Alex said, you know, we don't have the other industries quite ready to mm. adopt what we have for them. And so those other industries that we do our work for, um, I could see that perhaps there's some lagging behind there. But um, but I think like our industry in general, like we are we are on top of it and we are there and like, you know, we've got things such as the can slam circuit that's coming up and, 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 and getting started. And so these are things and initiatives that we are working internationally with. And so I think that we're, we're our industry is on time. We're just working on the other ones. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> no, I, I, I think your point is well taken there. Um, you know, early adopters and, and when new technology comes out, it, it, it takes time for, for people to realize and, and perhaps have to make the investment in, in not only computational power and, and HR people, but, uh, um, you know, change processes. And with big organizations, uh, things become entrenched and, and sometimes challenging to, to break that. Um, Susan, could we, could we hear from you about uh, whether you think Canada is lag, lagging on the application of LIDAR? So I look at it, uh, there's public sector and there's private sector. And then on the private sector, you know, we're looking at different verticals. Public sector, we've definitely been behind compared to advancements in the U.S. Um, and that started back in the imagery days also. Um, you know, in the U.S., they were doing countywide, statewide imagery surveys or imagery acquisitions and orthophoto production before Canada was. Um, and even now, you know, that's not, uh, that is, you know, more major municipalities and um, provinces are doing these large scale imagery acquisitions, but still not um, everywhere in terms of LIDAR. The federal government is now on board, um, but it, it came out of flood mapping um, with climate change. Private sector, it all depends on, on the vertical. Um, I think we are behind what's happening in the U.S., but we are catching up. And what's happening in the U.S. helps our industry because we can always cite case um, uh you know, case stories of, of what people are doing in the U.S. to show folks here that are in the same industry vertical that, yeah, there's an application and you need to be using it. For example, forestry, um, you know, going from um, uh, area-based forest inventory to single tree forest inventory, um, going from plots to area-based to single tree, um, you know, that sort of evolution is, is taking off in the U.S. and we're starting to get there in Canada. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're always going to be kind of the little, little, little brother kind of, you know, running to keep up, but we'll get there. Um, and I think, you know, folks like who we have on the panel today and, and you, Tim, you know, as a pioneer, um, it's just important that this work continues. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, it reminds me of the, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau statement of, uh, uh, like, being a mouse sleeping beside an elephant uh when it rolls over you really got to pay attention and and but but the u.s with their multitude of of people uh finance um initiatives and 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 also i think prowess to make money um you know the americans are very uh very Capitalism, yes. in that regard yes yeah. Um, Alex, let's go to you. Oh, no, I, I, Ken finished off last time. Ken, let's go to you, then Alex, and uh, we'll see how we're doing for time, but I think we're getting close here. Yeah, I think when we talk about LiDAR, at least from the airborne and UAVs perspective here, um, I think earlier today in my presentation, I, sh I showed where we mapped out BC, where, um, you know, there's tons of corridors, a few forested areas that we we're very interested in. But there's a lot of areas in Canada that that's so vast and there's no data over it. And I know the federal government is trying to do their national elevation strategy and map it out because uh, sometimes I go to these areas and with my drone and all this stuff and I need a and I need a terrain follow. And I and I download a DEM from say SRTF data or something, right? And it's just like a mishmash of, of uh inaccurate products so and at that point i'm like wondering what how safe is it to fly with a drone you know what, what kind of mm -hmm. what kind of safety standards are there and is there is, is there obstacle avoidance on my drone so that all really impacts it so i think like where where there's a need for data in in canada say the highways the power lines the 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 the, the real forested logging areas you know those have been mapped out tons and tons and tons of over the years and since you know since like Terra started business in 1985 or something right but uh, in a larger picture here there are a lot of gaps mm -hmm. no for sure uh, Alex what are your thoughts on that 
Um, I loved Susan's thought on uh, the Canada and the United States. Something I, I love joking about. You know, Canada doesn't do it until the states proves it works. And I live in Eastern Canada, so I've got twice the material to tell, you know, prove to people that it works before I actually get to do anything with it. Um, but uh, yeah, when it comes to lagging in, in lidar, yeah, that is kind of it's a hard question to answer because there are some places in the world that is that they're taking it farther, but I wouldn't necessarily mean that doesn't necessarily mean that technologically we are behind. Um, yeah, it's, it's more that uh, there's a lot of interesting technology coming out there. And so even if we are behind, we won't be behind for long. Um, even look at things like the space program. I am so excited for that starship made some amazing progress last week um even if it's a, not a reusable rocket we can now we can now put a ton and a half up with little effort so i can only imagine the amount of instruments that are going to be coming out that are going to be able to support our networks um externally however on the same side we are slightly lacking in things like legislation um there are some legislations that you know a company was asked to help build the legislation and so they made sure that it was exactly the way that, that their company can execute it um which automatically ties the hands of any innovation that comes out past that oh we need it done with this instrument well that instrument is now outdated and imprecise compared to this instrument well that doesn't matter because the legislation is for this instrument um yeah there, there there's there is we are a little bit behind i suppose um if we don't do anything about it now, we are going to get lost. We're going to get left in the dust. Um, but at the same time, things are changing so quickly that I, I'm not even sure where to hop on or where not to hop on, really. No, some good good points there. I, I mean, I can uh, add a few comments here on the Topo Bathy world. Um, you know, I, I, I go to things like GeoWeek and just, just am in awe of the amount of bathymetric LIDAR being acquired by the United States, whether it be NOAA or the USGS. NOAA, specifically along their coastal areas, repeat surveys after hurricanes and so forth. Uh, I just, I guess we just don't have the population here and the value per square kilometer of our land like, like in the States uh, for those things. And I, I guess the second point I'll make is, is how the USGS is really, a, really going after and has seen the value in Topo Bathy LIDAR for river surveys. And they are really pushing that out there. Um, our federal government is is sort of dipping their toe in the water on occasion and, and putting a few small RFPs out. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, Quebec is uh, uh, probably the most progressive thinking in terms of provinces, um, but nowhere near the scale of, say, the USGS. And uh, But, um, you know, as you state, Alex, uh, as they define the case studies and, and show the value in it and the monetary return and, on investment, um, you know, I'm sure we will catch up. Uh, where we ever get to the magnitude of business that's done in, in the U.S., perhaps not. But, uh, um, you know, I feel confident we have a, a very good industry. We have some great educational institutions, some great companies that are, are collecting data and, and processing it down the road and so forth. So uh, I think the future is quite bright. And, uh, you know, folks like you on the panel are, are really adding to the education of the broader geomatics industry in this topic. So uh, thank you again for, for your time and your participation and your valuable insights.